here's the thing. If you've got a business and you feel like you're just not making enough money, you're turning money and you're just paying yourself a wage and you're frustrated by that fact, that might be because your business is broad in the marketplace. Now, the real win is when you're a rich in a niche. See, the ultimate experts is where all the money goes. Think about a doctor. A normal doctor will earn a normal salary. A specialist doctor earns a much bigger salary because they're the expert of their thing. We want to take that philosophy and put it into our business. And that's what I'm going to do with my guest today. This is the philosophy for making big money in your business. Let's take a listen. Hello, campers. Welcome back to the Business Broadcast, the podcast designed to help grow your business. And uh, we're charting more of you listening and watching than ever before. And JB joins me with your blue eyes. Thank you very much. Are you related to Daniel Craig? No, I'm not. No. Um, he, uh, I'd be his ugly twin brother if I was, wouldn't well, I? Good eyes, though. But um, thanks, mate. I appreciate it. And I say that in a heterosexual way. <laughs> I wish you wouldn't. Um, but um, you said it there. The the, the 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 podcast. Wow, hello. The carb coma from lunch has kicked in. The podcast designed to help grow your business. I love the fact that a couple of episodes ago, someone had listened to the show, discovered it, and started doing P and Ls. Because yeah. I knew as soon as you said to him about his numbers, and he was like, "Oh yeah, we're doing about 100. I was like, "Oh no." Oh no, Sinclair's going to go berserk here. Yeah. But from the 8th of March, I were doing P&Ls. I was like, that's good though, isn't it? That's good. Yeah. People are actually taking tactical, actionable advice. Well, this is a very good podcast. That's why, because me and you do it. Um, my guest or our guest today. It's more your guest, isn't it, really? Well, it's got the youngest might... sounding voice of all time. Yeah. And he's, he's 40 now. Yeah. Um, Four zero. His name 40. is Aaron Rudman Hawkins, but he's likes not... to be called. Aaron. Aaron. He's, he's very like, touchy about that, isn't he? Oh, he just likes me. It's like if somebody called you Johns. Yeah. You're like, no, it's, it's just like. James. I just feel like saying Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. <laughs> Aaron. Call him Adder. Aaron um, has got a business called the Evertree, Evergreen Agency, marketing agency. A lot of businesses, a um, uh, lot of startup businesses start marketing agencies, I think, because it's quite low barrier to entry. Yeah. Do you think marketing agencies make money? Uh, I reckon probably one in ten. Sachi and Sachi? Yeah, all the, right. the, the big ones do very, very well. The Would you say your calls. business, your podcast business, is a marketing agency in many ways or not? How do you uh, describe your business? We are a content production agency. Content production agency. Sounds fancy, doesn't it? Yeah. But yeah, essentially it's marketing, isn't it, I guess. Mm. And clients come to you and say, I want to get my message out, help me. Yeah, we like Aaron said it probably. Um, we are kind of like him in the way we've got a niche. It'd be really easy to sort of more broadly and generally go. Oh yeah, we do you know general PPC or and that's what, what I like about your business. And on first discussions in the pre-chat chat that we had with Aaron, this is what I like about this mm. business is there are lots of marketing agencies, especially in the startup phase, that will just take all and sundry. Yes. You know, yeah, you're, you're a day nursery. Yeah, we'll we'll do your Facebook ads for you, your Google SEO. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 you know, you're an econ business. Yeah, we'll do that. You're a leisure business. You're a pub. You're a skip company. Yeah, you're a builder. We'll do it all. And then I don't think you really understand how it all works. What I like about him being a retail brand. So, he, in his own words, if you've got a lawnmower, yeah, shop lawnmower shop, and you want to sell your lawnmower on the internet yeah, as well, yeah. We're your people. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, when, when I really trust buying into someone, so if an insurance broker comes knocking on my door, not that I'm ever going to change my insurance brokers because the person that I know has been around for a long time, but someone says, we just insure farm visitor attractions and we really understand this sector. And if you have any claims or we'll yeah. save you money because we know, you know, that's our back. That's when you really know someone's an expert and you, usually you're prepared to give them more money yes because th there's quite a lot of agencies now that have popped up that are like doing podcast services but mm. they're general market agencies who can produce a podcast like making a podcast yeah. not like this one which is world class but it's not you know making a podcast is not rocket science it's mm. like editing some videos and some audio together but the actual process of successfully launching a podcast which we do very well by the way yeah. subconscious plug um that requires more of a niche skill set the other thing i'm seeing in marketing agencies and why i think that lots of them are probably not making as much money as they would like is more and more i'm seeing marketing agencies who their default is to teach other people to launch a marketing agency yeah. Are you seeing yeah. that? I'm yeah, seeing yeah. that on Facebook well, ads always. all the time. And I'm like, 
that for me is a red flag. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the expert thing. I mean, I've spoken about this lots over the years, but the more and more I think about experts, they're the ones that make the money. If you think about mm. even doctors, you know, a general practitioner doctor makes an okay salary, but a surgeon that's a specialist in a field of medicine are the ones where all the yeah. money goes. Yeah. Um, you know, you think about antiques dealers that deal with just fine art rather than everything yeah they're the ones where all the money goes it's scary though isn't it when you're yeah. first starting out it's scary to go i'm going to go into this micro niche and i'm going to yeah. go an inch wide and a mile deep that's yeah. a little bit scary which i think is why you get generalists mm. who maybe then niche down over time it's another thing i mean i always say that you know amazon started selling books in 1994 and niched into books and then yeah. broadened out over a period of time i think that's the better way to go isn't it yes start with the niche and then broaden up yeah if you broaden up no one what, what did you say in the last uh, podcast Com a confused mind never buys yeah you know and i think that's a similar sort of thing to what we're talking about here that yeah if you are all and sundry and all friends to everyone mm. Mm. i think you can sometimes so we've more recently, I've had more clients approaching for like brand support, a brand strategy, because I've worked with big, big companies doing that kind of stuff as, as like a previous career. They've come to me because they know of me, but they've got to know me through the podcast. I would never take on like a general like branding client just for branding, if that makes sense. But they'll come for the for the niche and then they go oh you can also do all this other stuff for us you can support us in that way i think that's a that's not a bad way for a business to operate no. but i think being known in that space and that niche is really powerful it's, it's, it's easy to break in isn't it if you are the expert in a niche yeah. and then then broaden up over a period of time it's like the, the you know it is so even if you think about apple when they really started out their computers like i'm talking about what's next steve 70s 80s whenever they started mm. it was much more niche computing then they like brought super computing for yeah programmers and developers wasn't yeah, it? it yeah wasn't and consumer arts electronics and, 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 yeah and, yeah and, um, design and stuff like yeah, that that's it. then they broadened all yeah. went wrong and then he came back and got rid of a lot of the product range and then you know and now they're all things to all people again but it's really interesting. I think if you've got a if you've got a brand or a reputation or a niche skill set that you're so well known, you're such an expert in that mm, thing, then mm, you can mm. take the time to almost I think of it like a brand extension. So rather than just doing another thing, like that's another vertical that you do, because mm -hmm. otherwise it could be too easy. And, and we had this in a previous episode um, that we recorded a couple of weeks ago. It would have come out a couple of weeks ago where the person wanted to move on to like the next thing in their business. Yeah, as the they didn't say it in so many words, but as the solution to their, their cash flow problem, but actually getting their existing business right first is the better move than splitting their time and spreading themselves Absolutely. too thin. Okay, so let's talk about the business. What's the revenues, JB? Uh, 60K per month as it stands at the moment with 12 employees. And his challenges, I'll hand you over here because this wow. is war and peace. These are the longest challenges we've ever had before. That's not even a joke, is it? So challenge number one, strap yourselves in, guys. In fact, if you want to, if you're not bothered about the entire challenge, go and make a cup of tea. And by the time you get back, I'll still be telling you challenge <laughs> yeah. one. Uh, challenge one, leads. Digital marketing is an extremely crowded marketplace. We recently pivoted to focus purely on partnering with e-commerce and retail brands as we wanted to move up the food chains in terms of the caliber of brands that we work with. We've done that successfully, winning several several six-figure accounts, annual retainers, but we're finding it incredibly difficult to get a foot in the door or opening conversations with more brands. We have a very strong offering, excellent results, case studies, and we'll easily convert one in five conversations that we have. It's getting those five conversations, though. I need some J&J &J magic to help me. Oh, I'm glad you read that all out for the J&J. &J. I know. That, that was about halfway through, I was like, I don't feel got enough breath in me, but it yeah. just spurred me on at the end there. Okay. It's a little ego boost. <laughs> It's so long. I'm trying to. So it's basically getting more leads. Get more so, leads. Yeah. Okay. Challenge number two. Challenge number two. Positioning. He's. You know when someone's writing very long when they put like a colon. Positioning. Yeah. And here comes the context. Yes. Yeah. Positioning. While we've always been a jack of one trade in terms of what we do as a business. For years, we were a jack of all trades. We decided at the start of 2023 to pure to focus purely on e-commerce and retail brands, but I said that isn't exactly a niche as such. With more than seven and a half thousand digital marketing agencies in the UK, bloody hell, albeit more, uh, most of them are under five people. 
I'm wondering if we further niche down into one specific vertical, a sector we know, like, and have the most experience in, we, which also feels like the most natural for us, uh, which, which most feels natural for us is home and garden. We've discussed positioning ourselves as the go-to home, garden, and lifestyle digital marketing agency, the lifestyle bit, so as not to alienate some of our existing clients and give us a slightly wider appeal to brands that fall just outside of home and garden. Got it. Challenge number three. Oh, Jesus Christ. Can I- Okay, <laughs> three. Building my SLT, my senior leadership team. Yeah, I like that. You can tell he's a marketeer because he has yeah. cool little acronyms. The sluts. I can't say that. Can you? I can't say sl- SLTs. Currently, we have two sides of our agency: SEO and paid media. But we have uh, uh, both have a head of uh, head of department, and under them sits a team of three or four who do the work. As we grow, I'm wondering how we evolve our SLT. Specifically, I see a gap between the two heads as they both look at their respective disciplines, but we don't have anyone who bridges the gap and oversees both or looks at the bigger picture for our clients. It's not over, guys. I know what you're thinking. Yes. Um, I guess that this is part of my job as the MD, but my focus is growing the business. So whilst there isn't an issue right now, I'm wondering as we grow, will we need someone who sits above or in the middle of the two of them as heads and maybe as like a head of client services or a head of delivery type role where they effectively focus on the bigger picture for our clients hold fire guys because there's more to this um, the rest of the slt is fine we have an acting fd my wife also works in the business and looks after the people and we want to stay uh, somewhat lean in our setup thanks for listening today guys we'll see you in the next one <laughs> don't go anywhere we're just getting warmed oh, wow. up uh, where does he but, want to be in one year but good he's got clarity on the challenge uh, yeah. I do like that uh, in one year he wants to be a team of 15 plus 1 million quid in top line turnover 80k a month uh, currently on 750 annually and 60k per month 200k of net profit currently at 120 and what does the business look like when it's finished? Well, at the end of this podcast, it'll be finished, <laughs> oh hopefully. Uh, in 10 years, when I'm 50, we'll have a group of small boutique agencies supporting e-commerce and retail brands. I feel we can leave it there. Because agency group. He's now then done a business plan for every single thing he wants to do. Um, <laughs> A financial targets. You say about the four businesses, you know, the business you are, the business you want to be. Yeah. He's, he's gone 40 businesses. The 10 and that you are now, the 10 you want to be. And the financial targets, 10 million turnover, and he wants to get to a 2 million net profit. Okay. Um, do you make the profit they want to make? What's the answer to that? I don't know. So far down. Where am I scrolling? He said, into? no, our no, profits fine. provide a good way to Where me. even is that? I can't yeah, even yeah. see it on the yeah. screen. Uh, I mean, so yeah, he's basically making wages from the business. Yes. Which, look, I just want to put it out there. That's most businesses that are doing that they're making wages and really the game is to make wages a commercial wage and a profit um and i knew that really because here's something i always do you know i'm working out revenue per employee it's one of the first things i do with our guests on the show yeah it's like oh what's the annual revenue and then i divide it by the um uh people the big pool, that's right, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> you got Lunch all the acumen, I'll just, I'll yeah. just help nudge you there. And I worked out... Take 60. the big number, divide it by the people that make the big number. Yeah. That and I worked out, he's getting roughly £60,000 revenue per employee. Uh, he's then got to pay wages out of that, rent, overheads, whatever it is, yeah. tax um, for running the business. So, difficult. Mm. difficult but i think this is most marketing agencies i think i I think you've got an owner that's making an okay salary and then responsible for lots of people that work for them yeah very difficult to turn these into commercial property enterprise as i'm growing an agency i am i'm finding that maybe too late that that is exactly right because every time you get busier unless you can and maybe we'll have this conversation with aaron today but unless you've got a super super niche where you're paid solely on the results that you get for people client services becomes and or brand leader yes or that as well but if you bring in five more clients in most client services agencies you're going to need another one or two people to service the demand of those clients so every time you bring in another let's say you've you've got a 10k retainer you bring in 50 but then you've got to add in like another 10k of costs Mm. it's quite it's a it's a bit of a juggle I don't, know if, I don't know what the answer is. But was. I think the, 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 you know, I was about to say, you know, what does the business look like when it's finished? And you might be okay with having a lifestyle business that pays you 100, 200,000 yeah, yeah. pounds a year. Yeah. But he's not, is he? Yeah. No. He said here, I want a 2 million net profit with a 10 million turnover. Yeah. I'm not saying it's impossible. I just think this is very difficult to do it in this space. Do you know the model that 
I've got some mates who run digital agencies and they've they've shifted recently to a profit share model. So they yeah. come in, they don't charge that like retainer sort of management of the ads account. They they basically, they have like a, 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 a they draw a line in the sand of what the company is currently doing oh. and then they take a percentage of the uplift. So, But again, that could only work with certain, he maybe couldn't do that with garden furniture and homewares because there's not enough of a margin. This only really works for like sort of like investment type models or very sort of like high purchase price models potentially but that gets you from the my, my power's gone from um doing sort of 30 grand to 75 grand a month just switching the model got rid of half what, the what how do you make sure that you keep the client sticky and the client goes i'm paying you too much now and i'm not making enough i don't want to do that anymore well it's on a, it's on a revenue share basis so yeah, any, but what if that client only, goes I don't want to do that with you anymore. Well, it depends on where you're driving the leads to. But if, for example, you're saying clever in the back end of your CRM system, they're kind of stuck and sticky with you forever because otherwise, or if you get it to a, like the lead is general, there's a good platform called Go High Level, for example, and that runs pretty much everything. It can be your CRM, it can be your email marketing, it can be your distribution of jobs. You can then tie it into a platform like a teamwork and it can distribute like task management and all that stuff. If you've got that, and there's a guy who came to one of your seminars, Dan. Um, who's done this exact model? He's got ninety marketing agency clients, yeah. and he's never lost a single one because they are they are so tied into that system that he's but built. He owns the website. He owns the website. They they own their own website, but he owns the CRM. So all those leads that are generated via his ads go into their CRM, but sits on his platform. Oh, maybe we're talking about someone else. Someone that comes to my seminar. He owns like I think like a hundred websites. Oh, that might be somebody else. Yeah, yeah, that might be somebody else. I think you 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 can you can help him. Yeah, no, yeah, you've I got think, this champ. I've yeah, got yeah. faith in you. Um, As George Michael said, "You've got to have faith, the faith, the faith." I think we should get you. We should do the questions first on this. You know, sometimes we do. Okay, that. yeah. Uh, let's get him on. Let's get him on. Hey, Aaron, how are you? I'm very well. Yes, thank you so much for having me on. You guys were making me laugh with uh, with. I'm po it didn't look that long when I was writing those challenges. I'll be honest. Did it sound long when you were listening back to them? No? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it did. And we cut them out. We yeah. cut a lot of it out. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. Should, should we get Aaron, Aaron to summarise the business to yeah. start with? Like we always summarise like the business summarize in, in a shorter way than you write. <laughs> <laughs> I will do. Yeah, no, uh, the business called The Evergreen Agency. Uh, we're a digital marketing agency specialised in, in working with e-commerce and retail brands. Based in Oxfordshire, we work across the UK. Uh, we do three things principally. We uh, help with their SEO, with their paid search, so uh, pay-per-click, and their paid social advertisers, I think Meta, uh, Meta Ads. And I like to think we're an agency big enough to cope, small enough to care. Oh, that's a good little strap line, isn't it? Big enough to cope, small enough to care. Um, and you mentioned homewares, gardening. That's kind of become your niche area of specialism. But what, what kind of, uh, what, who would be like an ideal avatar brand? Is it someone who's got like a chain of 10 lawnmower shops, but they haven't got an online presence? Is it high street brands or who, who's question, your market? Okay, but yeah, that's, I like. Yeah, it, it, that's we do work with the mix. Yeah. Uh, some of our brands have uh, have retail stores uh, and then they'll often have a wholesale side to their business and then we will look after their entire direct to consumer so all their website all of their direct uh, website sales so gotcha. it might be yeah we and we do a lot in the home and garden space and do you work with any brands that are um they're solely just going down does, does anyone come to you and they've gone i've got this great product i can source it we can cash flow it you just you guys do the marketing or do they always have like another arm to the business as well as the the sort of the e-com part to it it tends to be more that they have uh they'll have a, a bricks and mortar they'll have wholesale and then they'll have the the direct to consumer arm uh that tends to be the case Gotcha. It doesn't have to be, but it does tend to be the case. How And how big are they? Are these stores that have got like five bricks and mortar stores or that they've, you know, is that kind of the demographic or yeah, do they it, tend it, to be it, trade? So some of our smaller brands will have one or two stores um, or single location. And then others, we've got some brands that will maybe have 60 or 70 stores across the country. Gotcha. Okay. How did you, uh, how did you get into the marketing space in the first place? Well, ask him how he got his first customer. Well, why don't you? Why <laughs> <laughs> it's the same sorry, question, Aaron. but it's a better way of asking it. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. sorry. How'd you, first back, <laughs> How'd you get your first customer, everybody? First first customer uh, was a recommendation from from a friend. 
um, we used to work with really small, the small local mum and pup type businesses. So it'd be your local yoga teacher and your local accountant and your local pest controller, stuff like that. But how did they know that you could do this sort of thing? Uh, because I used to build their website. So back in the mid 2000s. But how did you get your first customer to go, just go, Aaron, the world has just come to me and said that you might be a person that can build a website? It would have been, how would it have been? It would have been recommendations from, a, it would have been from a friends. It would have been people, just people saying, oh, this guy knows some stuff about web, uh, websites. Right, yeah, Get yeah. him to have a look. Okay. I, what I like about this business uh, is I like the niche stuff, the, the stuff that we spoke about mm. in the pre-chat chat and the pre-chat to you coming on air. I like that because I think you can become a master of a niche. And I do believe there are riches in niches. If it was my business, and this is a tip that I give lots of entrepreneurs and business owners, I would get a flip chart, a good old fashioned flip chart. I'd have that in the office and I would write a list of 10 companies, one per piece of flip chart paper that would, if I could have them as clients, they would literally game change my business. Mm. So, you know, I don't know, if you've done it for Wix, for example, the big people that sell furniture and garden and homeware and that that sort of stuff you just write weeks well how do i get in to that person of weeks right i've got to write a letter to the ceo i've got to get direct meetings and you do like a spider diagram on the whole piece of paper that it gets you to the decision maker at weeks i'm just using this as a as an example here and then you you write that list of 10 people because in my experience if you got just 10 big players into this business that are all spending half a million pound a year with you mm. you're there um and that's what i yep. would do yeah and, and no, it I, makes sense we, we my we, experience we, i knew just say here and my experience yeah. is most people don't do that and the ones that identify who their dream avatar customer would be for evergreen marketing agency and then you work out how you're going to go and get them oh mamma mia yeah we've we've done a little bit of that and that's one of my um one of my key sort of challenges is how much we staple our colors to this niche flag because to give you a little bit of context so we haven't always been in the home and garden space we've increasingly done more of it over the years uh, as well as some other sectors not the only ones we've done more and more in the f and b so food and beverage space and a few other verticals but one of the problems we've we, we've got as we're moving up the food chain growing the business is it's it's that positioning it's getting those leads uh and we're deciding how much do we just go all in on a particular vertical and do what you're saying really then go to town really identify exactly those prospects and really go after them because i think we kind of definitely in the past and i think we still do to a point fall into that trap of we're trying to talk to everyone therefore we're talking to no one mm. and it's 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 that brave decision of okay how much and we have we've increasingly leaned into into uh, this particular sector um I'm just wondering, I guess my key, one of my key questions today is just to find out if you were in my shoes, how much would you just go all in on one, on one sector? Yeah, I would, I would dominate it and then broaden up after that. Because then what I would do is if it was my company, I would dominate that sector, then put an MD in to look after that part of the business. And then I would start, um, and that's you know if you look at Saatchi and Saatchi and these massive marketing agencies they're brand sector or they have sectors within the wider group but usually companies do this so well because they dominate in the sector now law firms are another one that do this really really well they dominate in commercial law and then they put a senior partner to look in after that and they go all right shall we set up a divorce arm now and we'll put a partner in to look after that but they they, they do one at a time accountants are exactly the same bog standard accountants all things to everyone then they get a tax specialist arm then an inheritance tax specialist arm then a mergers and acquisition specialist arm you know uh, uh, and this takes time to build mm. this but that is the way to go and then you put a partner um you, 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 uh, an, 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 an md of that sector maybe give them some shares to look after that maybe if that's what you want to do I'm, you know i'm not telling you what to do on how to your ownership structure your business and then you move on and they say right we're going to dominate the care home sector now um, we'll have a team that looks solely after care homes 
um and that, that's why i would do it in you know uh, it, the, the, this all starts with making that list of who your dream customers are uh, and if you did that that would really make you to focus right i've only got to get 10 of these people i'm surely i can get five of them um yeah. this year uh, and you you then you go to them with results proven results because you've done it for someone else in your sector uh, and people love buying from people that serve their competition can't help yeah, ourselves exactly. we we definitely are on this path i think we're just not being uh, as aggressive as maybe as we need to be to, to get there uh, and I think a part of that is because we it's only since the start of this of, of 2024 that um, I've actually been able to get myself off the tools I've, I've spent the last two or three years building the team very organically um, and been in the thick of everything been been right on the tools doing all of the work we'd sort of we'd go out there we'd win a client we'd get it back in and that would force me back on in the thick of the work for two or three months and then I just about managed to get myself back off um, by the team doing the work and then we'd win another one I'd be straight back on so where we've built the team now we're up to let's say about a dozen people it's enabled me to get bring my head uh, up and sort of have a look around what's going on and the first step we did in 2023 was we really we pivoted the agency to focus specifically on e-commerce which was a step in the right direction to we wanted to move up the food chain is how i described it to the team so we wanted to move away from the really small businesses and up to those kind of retail brands which we've done but what we're the, the problem we've got now and i think it ties into exactly what you're saying is that e-commerce is still incredibly broad and so we've identified a target list and it's it's within across it's across several verticals but again it's still not cutting through mm. and so our content and all that we're doing is just not cutting it and so that's why i'm like okay do i need to take it a step further and just further niche it down and just really go after say home and garden or lifestyle or something like that it's interesting i just wanted to so, so you, you know, I've got some experience in this through owning party pieces. There's two things that I want to say. Um, uh, uh, first of all, no, I'll come back to that in part two. I think what makes a business great is when, you know, you came to one of my seminars yesterday. You came to Investorpreneur. You know, I said what makes a business amazing is when they pull, not push. When they pull opportunities towards them, whereas most businesses push for opportunities, like you have to knock on doors. Certainly, at the beginning, you're, you're a pusher, aren't you? You know, you're, and if you've got brand, you pull the opportunities towards you. I think the fastest way of making that pull not push thing happen is to become an expert within a niche, because it's much easier to dominate a niche than dominate the broader marketplace. So make sure you remember that. You're still there, Aaron. Yeah. yeah yeah absolutely okay. no, I'm absolutely there. Yeah. yeah no i completely agree i'm, I'm sort of nodding along and yeah. the the, uh, the actually the event yesterday was fantastic by the way thank, thank you again yeah. for that i love that it's hard being me but someone's got to do it <laughs> <laughs> not joking um and then the, the next thing i just i think for listeners i think you know sometimes where we can yeah have a, someone that's an expert in a niche um so i've got part of pieces which is a lifestyle brand would you call that a lifestyle brand Aaron? like supplying party stuff and parties yeah, absolutely i would yeah 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 so we don't do any paid for seo but the the website ranks really well mainly probably because it's 20 plus years old now and i think that obviously is a big part of google's yeah, it will be, yeah. yeah thing and then we pay per click we're spending around 20 grand a month i would happily spend fifty thousand pounds a month if i could get the roas to work we're only working on like a 2.24 2.5 2.75 ro roas return on ad spend yeah. um, and we're not doing any paid social in your experience i think because i you know a lot of people are not doing pay per click in their businesses whether that be paid for social paid for google ppc they're just relying on seo um or they're relying on other forms of marketing i still think google ppc and paid for social is a massive way of getting instant business into your business where do you see most people's roas on pay-per-click in your experience uh, between three and five as a, as a kind of a general rule, most of our brands are in that sort of three to five ROAS bracket. If you're under three, I'll happily have a look at it for you, James. Yeah, Give well, we've, we was doing it in-house. We've just appointed an agency. Um, but please, can you d put a diary note to come back to us in 60 days' time? Because uh, I'd love you to, to look at it. Uh, I, I mean, I think... They, 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 I want to give them sort of 90 days, 60 days to yeah, look at course, it. Yeah. But. Uh, there's a big difference between three and five and i want to know are your clients closer to a three or closer to a five 
depends on the sector. Um, so some of our clients, three, it, generally the lower the ROAS, the higher the price point typically. So we've got some clients who, whose average purchase uh, might be, you know, four figures. And so they, they are absolutely fine with the three times ROAS. Yeah. Uh, whereas others, lower, lower price point, lower margin. Um, so fashion, for example, they really need to be hitting four and a half to five to make yeah. it financially viable uh, for, their, for their brand to work. Well, see, see Party Pieces used to do four and a half times row as uh, back in the day, but it's become more expensive. You know, these are all the stuff that I'm being told. You know, I'm trying to work it all out. It's a, you know, I'm happy to say probably in a year's time, I'll be a lot more experienced at it. Um, the other thing I was going to ask about, about return on ad spend for people. So I think it's, you know, it's, whilst we've got you here, it's worth, worth talking about it. Sure, sure. Do you do you trust that the algorithm gets or the, the sorry the software behind Google AdWords actually gets it right? Because I think I go on click on a pay per click lead, you know, for flights or something. I go on the website and then I might book it at work on my computer or I sell Tracy to book it. And so I, I've got that, or oh, everything's happened there because of the ad. But then my PA's booked it and she's done it on a different IP. So. So it's not completely 100%. Do you agree with that? Completely agree. No, it, absolutely. I mean, in, in recent months, um, the, the world of, of, of online tracking, conversion tracking has evolved hugely. Um, and to, to keep it really, really simple, we're now, the way that PPC, so Google and Meta and all of these different platforms, the way they track a conversion, i.e. a sale, uh, is now what's called data-driven attribution, which in layman's terms, essentially means that how that conversion, how that sale is attributed um, is based on an algorithmic calculation um, for where it's going to attribute the value. So what that means is it's no longer a this, we are going to attribute 100% of the value for that conversion to that click or to that ad. Now it says we're going to rely on the system to attribute some of the value to this ad and some of the value to this click and some of the value to this in engagement or this interaction. And the reason for that is for exactly what you just describe and is that users are using different devices. We, we, you've got issues around privacy and cookie policy and GDPR and all of these things come into mm. it and Google and Meta and all of these platforms are having to adjust the way they track users I, across the internet. Because <laughs> it's interesting, whilst people are listening to this, because I think business owners, especially entrepreneurs that don't have massive attention span because their attention is over so many things, you know, they, they click it, you know, like I do, probably every day I go into my Google Ads manager to look at this stuff. Uh, I have a snapshot in time. And I go, all right, we spent 10 grand this month and it says it's only turned into 24 grand. But then I think, but my sales might be 75 grand in total from the website. And I'm like, I don't believe we've got all that from organic and, and sending emails out. I think more of it's... <laughs> so I've got all of these smart computers telling me this stuff and I just think, no, it's wrong. I know it's better than that. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, that's really what I'm trying to, you know, give to the 6,000 people that will end up listening to this podcast. If you're a frustrated business owner and you're seeing your ROAS is too low, sometimes you just take a step back and think, hmm, actually, I'm getting good the sales. Where sales come from? Yeah, because I think… Can I, give you, can I yeah. give you guys a really good, really simple and a really smart way of um, sort of analysing your data that anyone could do that's, that's really easy and anyone, you don't have to be techie at all to do this. Most businesses will be tr using Google Analytics or some variant thereof to look at their traffic. So you can go in and you can see this is how many sales we had. Yeah, you would agree with that? Yep, yep. Right. So a great way, of, a concept that I, I came up with years ago is I call it the backbone of digital marketing. And what this is, is fundamentally there's only four ways that any brand makes sales and, and gets traffic and makes sales online. And so you can look at your data and you can bucket these into four pillars. And so you can look at your data and you can just isolate all of the traffic, the clicks and the sales that are being attributed to what I would call buying the buying it. So any kind of advertising you're doing, then you can bucket them into what you own. So, uh, so that would be your brand, your repeat customers, your returning customers. Then you can bucket them into those that you are nurturing, i.e. that's all of your social media, regardless of platform. It's all of your email. Uh, and then you bucket everything into what you uh, have earned, i.e. through SEO. 
And when you isolate all of the all of the myriad of different channels and platforms into four pillars, you can then see which of those you're over relying on. So with party pieces as an example, what I would want to be looking at, I would ask a different question if I wanted to see the performance. In isolation, yes, you could look at the ROAS. But outside of that, what you could do is you could go, okay, well, party pieces online the revenue today is X and I want to take it to Y. How reliant overall as a brand am I on buying that traffic in? And what correlation does that have to the turnover? And so you can run a really quick calculation and you can go, well, actually, I can see that we are 30% reliant on buying that traffic mm -hmm. in. And therefore, that has a, a, a knock on a domino effect to the revenue. Therefore, if I was to increase that to 40% or 50%, what would that do? Can I, can I ask another quick question? Well, you know, we've got a big expert here, obviously. I think you've... you've you're very articulate, don't you think, JB, in explaining yeah, this stuff? Yeah, 100%. Um, I Great think, communicator. Yeah, I think you're very good. And, uh, and one of your questions is, should I be paying to speak on stages? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely you should be. We'll come on to that in a minute. Um, the next thing, I know that Google, and I've watched all the keynotes, they say that the PPC does not generate... Um, SEO. If you spend money on PPC, it does not, you know, help you rank your website more. I just don't think that's true. I think if you spend more on PPC, your website ranks more. But no one's prepared to honestly say that that is the case. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you why you think that. And you, technically, that's not the case. There, there is no correlation. That's never been publicly uh, stated. Not that they would, but to say that PPC will have a correlation to SEO. So technically, that is the case. There isn't. However. There is a correlation between if you're bidding on any form of advertising, i.e. branded, search, shopping, etc., you are going to see and feel an increase in your organic and your wider visibility, which is going yeah. to come across on your other channels, because essentially you are front of the pack. You are, you are at the top of those results for a myriad of different search terms and, and inquiries. Therefore, <coughs> people are going to be seeing the brand and they're going to be searching for you by brand name. They're going to be repeat visiting, etc. And if, if someone does Google, I mean, it, I'm just fascinated by this stuff. If Google sees that you have lots of people visiting your website and they're coming back and back as a result of PPC, does that help with search engine optimization? Did these used to be called Alexa years ago or something like that? Or your Alexa rating? Is that, have I made that up? So, sorry, James, say that again. If So it's like I spend 100 grand on PPC on one of my websites, and that's driving so much traffic to it. And I continue to do that for a year. So I spent 1.2 yeah. million pound driving traffic to my website. Because so many people go on the website and click onto it and look at it, does that drive my SEO because I've got a highly visited website? Yeah, well, it will do in part because you are, by driving that amount of footfall to the website, you're increasing your brand awareness. You're getting engagement on your website. So as long as those people don't click and then bounce straight off and they don't like what they see, if they engage, then they're going to be there. They're going to know of you. Some people might bookmark your website. Some people are going to return to so, it. So, sorry, can I just say, so, so my direct question, if it's in people's history and they bookmark my website and spend more than three minutes going around it and looking on it, yeah. Does that help search engine optimization, in your opinion? Yes, 100%. So therefore, that is a fact then. If you've got a high-performing website and you drive PPC traffic to it, that does improve yeah. SEO then, as long as people stay on your website. Yeah, but from an engagement perspective, it does, because Google wants to... Do you know that, JB? Yeah, it would make sense, wouldn't it? Like I say, yeah, no one's willing to, to put their, their neck on the line and say that. Yeah, but, th but they are putting their neck on the line google is saying if you've got a website that people stick around on and look on and stay on and bookmark and it converts it's there what do they do they they put it as a an important website or they level it as a good website so is it help me out here Aaron? if i'm you know it's, yeah, it's, it, indirectly it's going to help so it's, it, it doesn't to be clear it doesn't have a correlation as in if you the more you spend on google therefore it's going to improve your seo rankings but the way a search engine will understand a website is if it, as long as it's got good engagement it's more um, the way i interpret your question is more from a usability standpoint because mm -hmm. if i'm driving 10,000, 100,000 people, forget the click, forget the SEO, 
people to the website once they have gone away from that click they've 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 closed their browser they've moved on to a different device i am going to have lost that paid click that paid click whether they convert or not is gone yeah. but the seo value the organic value is in they may now search for my brand they may now search for my specific product because they've been on the product they've seen the service therefore they're going to yeah. come back yeah. so that is a correlation with seo rather than a direct impact or influence on it Okay, I'm going to ask you one more question, just because while we've sure. got you. What do you prefer, Meta or Google? <laughs> Google, every day of the week. Yeah, the way I, I'll tell you, uh, the way I've always seen uh, your life. Why? Is, yeah, come on, give us the why. The, the way I've always seen it is Google, there is search intent, right? Yeah, So absolutely. with Google, I am looking for something. I'm looking for a product or service. I have a question. I have a need. With Meta... For the most part, when it comes to advertising, through Meta, it's I have always described it as interruption marketing, yep. right? I'm going on Meta to look at what my aunt had for dinner yep. and watch cat videos, right? I am not going on there to then see or be retargeted with a product. So if I'm a business, I am interrupting that user and saying, hey, did you want to come back and buy those pair of shoes? Whereas with Google, I'm only going to see those pair of shoes if I'm actively searching for them. Yeah, I agree, yeah. But, but uh, I love all that. But what about return on investment? If people put ten grand into Meta or ten grand into Google, where are you seeing the biggest returns as well? Uh, classic marketer's response: It depends on what you're doing. So, for example, a, a, a way we use a lot of Meta is through retargeting. So we will think of Google as prospecting, so to bring people in top of funnel when they're searching, when they have a vested interest in what we're marketing. And then we will use Meta as a form of retargeting yeah, to re engage that. that user. Maybe we offer them a discount to drive them back to the website to come. Yeah, so we do, that, in do our, that. No, no, we do do that in our leisure businesses, but we don't do that on party pieces. We actually. Oh, you, you need to get all over that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the that's the quickest win for you, hundred percent. Because otherwise, that twenty grand spend you're doing a month is either it's hit or miss. You've either you they, you either sold them or you didn't. Especially if you're not data capturing people. Which are probably yeah. not. And make sure you're you're using your you're setting up audiences on those platforms to then you know anyone anyone who goes on that website regardless of what they do on the website you're you're retargeting them to get in front of them again because you know what, only what, a tiny how? percentage of two or three people are ever going to convert so those are the ninety seven ninety eight percent of people I want to be staying top of mind for mm. those folks. And so you say you send twenty grand on PPC on Google to prospect them, uh, but then to remind them to buy, how much more would you see your clients spending on Meta to get them over the line? It depends on the, the okay, I keep saying it, don't know, it depends. It depends on the, on the volume give me of an traffic. Avatar so store, for example, yeah. if you've only got a few thousand hits, I don't know how many hits a party pieces get, but if, if you know, it, you could easily keep your brand top of mind for a thousand pounds a month, easily, unless you've got, you know, tens and tens and tens of thousands of, of people. Um, hitting the website. So you're saying using round numbers. So we spend twenty grand on PPC on Google, but then spend a thousand pounds on retargeting on Facebook, trying to get them over the line. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Not far off that. I would yeah, probably yeah, do it roughly, maybe. Yeah. Eight, I'd probably do an eighty twenty split. Yeah. I like this guy. I really feel you know what you're doing. I don't think you're going to get any business advice, but I think time. you've got some clients off the back <laughs> yeah, of it. I think yeah. you've got one. I think, you're, I think you'll get some calls off of this. Party uh, uh, piece is the existing agency, the incumbent that hasn't even really got started yet. <laughs> I feel sorry for them in advance. They're about to... <laughs> There, Aaron's just nicked their lunch, isn't he? Um, I still look, look, getting back to your business now, and I think, I think our listeners will be genuinely interested in that yeah, little convo really that we've just had there. Um, you, you, you've got to just find the better people. You, you know, I, you know, What's your average customer spend with you? You know, what did it, what does the average customer spend with you? It's it's gone up massively. So since we before we focused on on ecom, so you go back eighteen months, our average spend with a client was about thirty to forty k a year. Yeah. Uh, with us, so that's two. So I'm just going to stop you there. Like now, you've got to think: how can I find clients that spend a quarter of a million pound a year with us? Yeah. That's so now our clients in the last year we've increased that. So now our clients, on average, our wins of the last year is about 100k. Yeah. So, so just, let's go up. again. Let's go again. You know, find those bigger spenders. They'll be more enjoyable yeah. to work with. Um, yeah. the, 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 you know, they're not going to be scared about throwing 20, 30 grand a month for AdWords. You know, and uh, whatever it is to really see if you, you can get this going. Because sometimes the, the smaller people are so scared or haven't got the money to really give it a go mm. that you mm. can't actually give them the returns that you know you could give them if they would take a bit more risk. 
Um, yeah. I think we'll do the questions now, JB, because I, I, you know, I'm conscious of time here. Yeah, 100%. So let's have a look. So the question number one was, is it worth paying to speak on industry stages? You touched on this a second. Yeah, you said yes. I know. I mean, you've done that, haven't you? Yeah. Um, I know people that have done this and, and literally made millions of pounds from speaking on stage. Yeah. You've got to be a good speaker. Yeah, which he is. Yeah. Uh, but I, I would, did it at your event. I yeah. Did, I, I did. I had a stand. Not that you've charged me. You charged me for your friendship, actually, now I think about it. Um, no, so we, we had a stand. And as did part we of charge it? You? Yeah. Did we? Yeah. Oh, that's good. I'm really happy about oh, yeah. that. <laughs> we won't charge you for the next one. You're, you're now no, in double, the set. No, I've, I've done really well out of it. So I've I done one, I did 45 minute talk. Yeah. And the client value of that so far has been. 50 grand. 50 grand? And Four, how much do we charge you? Two and a half. Oh, don't tell me that. Yeah. <laughs> you were happy a minute ago. No. It's <laughs> triple. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I do think speaking on stage is, is really good, but you're good at speaking on stage, yeah. JB. Now, this guy sounds... Uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron, you sound oh, very com yeah, You sound yeah. very confident, yeah, yeah. but there's a difference between confidence and knowing how to speak on stage. Like, there's a difference on speaking on stage to presenting on video, uh, which I've learned the very hard way, because if you watch my earlier videos, it's like I'm on stage on video, and there's two very different things. Things. You watch a stand-up comedian on stage to how they are on TV. It is two different skill yeah, sets. Yeah, true. So, yeah, you've got the confidence, but well, that's great. And you've got the knowledge, that's great. Mm. Uh, we want those two things. They're the foundations. Yeah. You've really yep. got to finesse it to be good on stage, especially when you're trying to get expertise over, you know, uh, like if you start putting this level of content on slides the way you've wrote into this podcast, people will just not see your stuff. Um, it, it, it's got to be... Yeah, headlines and uh, you do need to do some practice. So I would do some free speaking stuff, mm. maybe get that recorded um, and send it into JB, not me. And then he can, his agency can probably give you some speaking advice uh, because you want to get that really good before you pay the big money to speak on stage. There's lots of yeah. events as well, Aaron, that will that will try and you probably get tapped up by them all the time anyway i mean every day at the excel center there's some like niche version of business or marketing or yes yeah, yeah, yeah. the overseas business show or the indoor business show or whatever it may be for any of those that tap you up if you're thinking about doing the speaking thing if go say i'll have a stand but you want to speak in slot yeah, absolutely that's yeah. the that's the way that i always do it. i would only uh, and speak, have a stand if i can speak and speak for free even if there's only 12 people in front of you yeah, just yeah. to get that 45 minute polished all the best ones that i see do the same talk again and again, again, and, again. and again and again and they know where to get all the laugh lines just enough laugh lines not too many that it doesn't yeah. detract from the actual message and the sale you're trying to do um so yeah i mean i th yeah absolutely what's the next question uh number uh, the number two and there was only two questions is it worth getting investment or borrowing to ramp up our marketing activities such as speaking or going to big exhibitions or not from my opinion, this business does not need capital. It needs knocking on doors and hard yeah. work. Uh, listen, if you, you want to open a theme park and you've got no money, you're going to need to get a big rich person to help you yeah. buy some £2 million roller coasters. This business is all about, you know... Bootstrapping growth. Yeah, it is. You don't need it. Yeah, that's what we've, that's what we've done up until this point. I'm just... Now I've, I've got myself finally off the tools i'm just really impatient now to kick us on and it's always that because it's it's bootstrapped it's always that chicken and egg of, of yeah, you know, it, i could do more speaking i could get us in work but lots of a lot of that happens in your business is you get a million quid in from some you know high net worth and you just find things to do with a million pounds that you probably wouldn't have done if it was your own money yeah, just because yeah, you've got yeah, it yeah. and then you start over-employing people. And lazy, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you don't want to be doing that. And you, and you want to, okay. you, you don't want to be paying a load of debt back. The, pro, I, my, the, the, the basis of this whole conversation is just go and get the right clients. Yeah. You know, yeah, just yeah. have 20 clients that spend half a million pound plus with you a year or look for million pound plus contracts. They are out there. Um, you just, it's a, really, it, it is a decision that you're only going to put your time and effort into people that are going to spend a million pound plus mm. with you. Do you know what I'd be doing if I was you, Aaron? I would be yep. using LinkedIn and I'd be topping would up you? What's that? that? LinkedIn, because I think you call yeah, it. Yeah. And I would be looking, because the, the great thing with LinkedIn, if you pay them, I think it's like 79 quid or whatever, you get that navigator system and you get, everyone's email details who can direct yeah, message people. But yeah. what I would be doing is because everyone 
like connects your LinkedIn. It's like, oh, hey, I'm going to talk to you about your business. I've got someone at the moment. He's like, so oh, can I just say, the so it's LinkedIn Gold and LinkedIn Navigator, two separate things. LinkedIn Gold? Yeah, I pay fifty pound a month for like gold membership, so I can reach out to. I've anyone. never, I've never heard of LinkedIn Gold. Producer Nigel, can you just uh, research that and come back to us? What's the name? is LinkedIn Navigator and LinkedIn Gold two separate things? Or is, or is LinkedIn Gold the same as like Hits Gold? Do you know what they're going to come back? He's going to come back and he's going to say, "JB, LinkedIn Navigator doesn't exist, and James, LinkedIn Gold doesn't exist." <laughs> <laughs> But I'll be using whatever it is, if it be gold or navigator, get the super duper recruiters version because then you can get everybody's um, email contact details. But what I would be doing instead of doing because everyone's doing that cold outreach thing, or let's just hit you know throw enough stuff against the wall and some of it will stick. I would look at those target brands that Jimbo said earlier. I would then go onto their website and I would show them where the holes in their website are. I would do little loom videos and I'd say, yeah, hey, I appreciate nice. you get, you probably get a hundred people trying to add you on LinkedIn. I just wanted to, if you give me 60 seconds of your time, here's one hack that you could get. Did you know that actually when you're pushing people to this landing page, you've got all of these escape hatches. What you want to do is data grab people and make sure you're building your email database and that will blah, 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 whatever the tip is going to be, if that makes sense. And give them something really tangible and actionable and I'd do the video and then I'd have a bespoke message under underneath the video going hey I've, I've, do, I've done you a, a video I appreciate loads of outreach in 60 seconds I just want to explain to you one thing that could tweak um, your website Can I, love to have a further conversation yeah, that's with you. a nice idea I like that so, I was thking about um, and let's use just, LinkedIn gold to make that happen it's a, oh okay <laughs> so they're two separate things what's the difference Nige about 29 quid <laughs> <laughs> One's gold and one's silver. Oh. Is that you it? were right. So so I was wrong and you were wrong, but we were both sort of right. Yeah. Should we call that a draw? But what, what's the difference between so with the sales navigators you can access people's data, can you? Um one of the things I was just thinking about uh that's interesting for Aaron's business. So yesterday, uh, Aaron, you was at my event and Grant Thornton were there. And one of the things that was the most powerful thing that we spoke about, I would say most accountancy practices are turning between 350 and half a million pounds. They're quite yeah. micro businesses run by accountants and they'll be all in sundry. Grant Thornton sell businesses, Christie sell businesses, Savile sell businesses, um, KBS, you know, all the usual ones. They sell every type of business. Grant Thornton have got 120 people in their mergers and acquisitions team just here in the UK. They employ 6,000 people in the whole business. So 120 people just selling businesses and they sell 70 businesses a year because they're so ultra fussy about what businesses they want to sell. Mm. So one to two million plus of EBITDA. So really two million plus is what they're looking at. It's got great big, bigger businesses, you know, and so their fees, you know, 300 to half a million pounds, 300,000 to half a million pounds to mm. sell each business. They're not after the 20, 30, 40 grand transactional seller business fee. Um, uh, and I think there's a good lesson there for you, Aaron. You know, like yeah. Grant Thornton only want the creme de la creme. Yeah, I think less is more, isn't it? Fewer, yeah. bigger accounts. But they just won't, they, you know, if you ring them up and go, yeah, I've got a, a six bedroom b and B. I I want to sell it. Like the phone just goes down like we're not for you. Yeah. You know, oh, I've got a 300 bedroom hotel. Yeah, we, we want to talk to you. It's really, you know, that it, there's some good lessons there that we need to remember. I think the other there quick is. hack as well for you, Aaron, is uh, as well as speaking, I think podcasts, being a guest on other people's podcasts, Absolutely. I think it'd be really valuable because you, you speak with such authority and enthusiasm about a subject. I actually think he should have his own podcast. Yeah, I was about to say, there's one called The Product Boss, which is based out of the States, but she helps... Um, e-commerce businesses it's part of the HubSpot network it's brilliant oh, okay. it's not my cup of tea at all but I just listened to because I kept seeing it pop up in the charts I was like well let me have a listen to the content although though it's not doesn't relate to my business at all it's really really good and she basically coaches standard retail businesses on how to move to an e-tail model which I think you could do as well yeah that's it e-tail I'll check that out that's a thing I'll isn't it out. e-tail I love that e-tail retail I've never heard that before have you not what I always I hear is, up. what I love, I love that little phrase, you're into bricks, let's get you into clicks. Oh, that is good. <laughs> that is good. 
Bricks to clicks. That's yeah, the name of your podcast. Yeah, yeah. There, you there we go. Um, I, like I, I, I do. I do think you should start. I think you should. You know, get in touch with JB and talk about getting your own podcast going forthwith, and mm. maybe do what I do and just. Well, it takes the time to build that up. Actually, I was. I was going to say coach people on how to do it. I, but I think that's another. But it takes time. Another thing that you outreach to them with as well. But you could have, yeah, you could have like. So three when episodes. I started it, like everyone would think, "Oh, this is a great little concept." But it was on the back of, you know, a quite a big YouTube channel and yes. years of doing it and yeah, books yeah, and stuff. Yeah. So people actually wanted to come on straight away. And I always think, oh, if I ever recommended this style to do it to someone else, <laughs> oh, we've got but one I've, person on, and now six weeks but before I've someone started else wants doing it. it. Uh, I've sort of recommended it to other companies and they do do it because they use it instead of it being yeah because I think it's a great model well, I, I've got a patent it for you, over didn't it <laughs> didn't I have, over in the first place um, but, can I have the details because I'm going to sue them <laughs> yeah. it's my idea but you but you could um, coach people so instead of doing the discovery call use your podcast as a discovery call that's a that's a really good effective use of your time. Say, so, look, I know you know the, the 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 challenge you've got within your retail business might feel unique and special to you, but actually, there's loads of people that we speak to, subconscious seed of expertise, that are going through the same thing. Why don't you come on the podcast? Me and you, I'll give you one to one coaching and guidance, effectively on your challenge, and maybe we work yeah. together, and maybe we don't thereafter. But I can help you on a one to one basis, but then also I can put out the content and help one to many. How does that, that sound? That is actually a brilliant idea. Oh, what, but do you two- think brands would go for that though? Because they're sort of you know kind of being. Uh, not airing, the, do you know what I mean? Like airing their dirty laundry a little bit. Do you well, you've just come on and done it with me. Do you've just come on and done it with me, sunshine. <laughs> True. True. Um, uh, listen, but but there's actually two things whilst doing content will help you. It's going to help you find clients, but it will also help you recruit because mm. what you tend to find is people in e-com will go on and watch content, learn in bits and bobs for their bits of work, go, oh, I really like this company. Um, and then you will have a great recruitment tool yeah. uh, over the next five, ten years. Um, Love that. There's a Love specialist that. e-tail. And also, one e-com. more thing, one more thing. Go it's on. not just about finding the customers. When you've found a customer, when you've found a customer, and then they go and check you out afterwards, if they see you've got loads of content, that yeah. just gets them over the line. Yeah, 100%. Um, check out Avask, A-V-A-S-K. They are a specialist e-commerce. I won't say e-tail now because you're mocking me. An e-commerce accountancy practice. I did some consultancy right. with them, and they've launched like three podcasts that are specialist to different sectors of e-commerce and online retail so have a look have a have a look at that okay i'll check those That's out quite yeah. you're amazing can i can, can I, I i'm so impressed by you i would like to give you a little plug jb can you sort out the plug yeah <laughs> i think we should give him a jingle no like oh, properly oh sorry right yeah. yeah so um this is um oh yes yeah, so it's a sound effect called funky quiz uh Aaron, you've now got about 27 seconds to hardcore sales pitch the entire uh, watcher and viewer network of the James Sinclair podcast. Please feel free to pitch your words as hard as you would like. Go. Okay. So oh, sorry, the jingle finished. I filled, I filled the entire time for you. We're going to play the thing again, <laughs> but this time it's just for you. You ready? Okay, here we go. go. Okay, so you can find out more about us by visiting theevergreenagency.co.uk. Uh, we're e-commerce retail specialists. Uh, we love, as you've heard, the home, garden and lifestyle space. And we're actively looking for more clients. We've got some amazing content. Um, and I am going to be setting up a, a um, podcast on the back of the fantastic advice from these two chaps today. So JB's yeah, got a client. You- Look at that. Oh, my God. Our work is done, mate. <laughs> And there is just um, one more thing that um, I just wanted to say. If you're that good at selling stuff online and you know how to do it, why are you not doing it yourself and building a website and selling stuff? Because that will impress clients really. That will get you all the best people. Mm. If you can say, look, I set up a gardening website. It's doing 100 grand a month. I imported all the stuff from the Far East. I've listed it. I mean, that's what... That's, that's what you should document on your YouTube and podcast as yeah. well. Yeah, I, I love that idea. And that is that is absolutely part of my roadmap uh, for the next 10 years, uh, 100%. Well, I, what's I, stopping I, you doing that now? Nothing now, as in, but I've only just got off the tools in the last three months. So it's I've just made that part of the plan. Mm. And it's, yeah, it definitely... That because if you came into me... Plan. And you say, this is my website. It's a Shopify website. Um, I sell £100,000 a month on it, and I spend £20,000 a month marketing it. I'm like, where do I sign the check? Because you are spending your own money Mm. doing what I want to do, and it would be just the most amazing case study. 
do you think? And then document the whole I don't thing think, as well, I suppose. I don't well. think, I absolutely know. People will just be like, literally, I'm past flirting, let's have a one night stand and get into business together. I, I'm telling you now. I didn't know where you were going there. <laughs> right, they're, they're into marriage. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're, they're, there's no three date rule here. This is first date stuff. <laughs> I love that. I yeah, I I've considered that moved right up the pe- or up the list of priorities. Yeah. You are, you asked earlier if you should get investment to ramp up your marketing. The only th- I think you need to invest your time and your expertise into your own thing. I don't think you need m- necessarily money to do this. I think you need the time and the headspace to do it now. Can I just I, I want to give you an absolute fact on this as well. An absolute um uh an absolute fact on this is Sorry, Nige was about to just knock over his computer and it really it threw me a bit there. He was trying to give us a... Uh, anyway, so the absolute fact is Teddy Tastic, one of my business, which owns Party Pieces, we supply lots of holiday parks and visitor attractions and zoos and farm parks here in the UK. I would say 60% of the people buy from us because we're operators and we use the stuff in our own businesses and we explain that and they just... Oh really? Do not they see us as giving advice because You're this is what we're doing in yeah, yeah. our business. It's tried, tested and proven. We're actually putting our money where our mouth is. It gives us a real yeah. competitive edge. And that's why I think wherever you can do that in business, mm. like when we wholesale ice cream to people, and the more I think about it now, JP, the more I think about it, when we wholesale ice cream to other parlours and we go, well, this is what we do in our ice cream shops and parlours. Oh, is it really? Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like no, we're actually doing this. And so we're giving, yeah, really, it's like, the, the, the big thing I think trying to get over in business is back of mind thinking. Like, what is the prospect thinking in the back of their mind that they might not say to you or they haven't actually thought of? Because if you're selling to mid level management, let's use my uh, ice cream story. Oh, I think we should be selling these flavors of ice cream. Um, and subconsciously they go, because Rossi sell them in their shops and these are their top flavours. Like they've become consultants to us because we've told them, but we haven't told them you should buy these because we think they'll do really well. We'll buy these because we know they will do really well because that's what we're doing. Tried, tested and proven. That's what people like. Yeah, that like back that. of mind thinking thing is coming more and more into my psyche really. Um, that we don't even know why we're buying something other until we really of brought forward that back of mind thinking that we go into a restaurant and if it if it looks cold and it looks naff in here even if the food's the best the back of mind's going i'm not sure why i don't like it in here or you get a vibe about a place Mm. whether it's good or bad it it can have your buying decisions you know you go into somewhere and it looks cheap you think quite everything's going to be really good value here you go in somewhere it looks expensive oh i don't think we can stay here It's, it's going to be expensive and whatever it is, back of mind thinking is a big part of how we operate as human beings. There you go. Um, so we're very excited to see your YouTube channel, to see, you. I, I think that could be so cool, to document the journey on creating an e-commerce brand yeah. as an e-commerce marketing agency. That's a, gr- I feel like and, a great th- thing. And be honest when it's not good as well. People yeah. will love yeah, that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, my God. We vlog it. Vlog it weekly. We've really done our Google. You know, Larry and Serge made a load of money this week. It's not fair. We haven't really done any. Samples turned up and the yeah. samples are crap and yeah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And these are all the challenges that our clients have. Then you've got lived experience as a doer yeah. of the stuff as well as a, yeah. you know, an expert in the thing. God, we're good at it, oh, JV. I can't wait to I see this, it. though. We're like the dick and dom of business advice. In fact, here you go. Comes full circle. How about the Evergreen Agency becomes the official distributor of Bert the Burke t shirt? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> For YouTube. Um, we've been getting some hate again in the comments. People saying we're being too comedic. Oh, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Um, uh, uh, look, look. I think you two guys are great, by the way. I just have to say, the f- I think this so format, we. We think is, we're I've great. seen it both before and after. I'm loving this, what oh, you guys are doing. Good. Thanks, Thanks mate. Um, no, li- listen, you're great, mate. Um, are you going to come and see us live at the Business Broadcast Live in the Leicester Square Theatre? June the 10th. Too right I am. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm all in. I'm all in on the James Sinclair train. So I'm, I was at your event yesterday. Choo-choo. Thanks. To, thanks. I've got to give, I've got to give, J- uh, I give Nigel a shout because I had a chat to him and he, um, and so I'm now signed up to the exec club. So you count bring me in, baby. I'm bring coming him in. to everything. Well, look, look, I will see you every month now for the rest of the year, whether it, and you're actually comped in as an exec club member into, um, 
into the Leicester Square live uh, extravaganza. God, the gift that keeps on giving. Oh, Looking my forward God. to it. It's going to be a great night. I better night. go and get cracking with this building, this brand of my own. Yeah, yeah, really. yeah. You had better, mate. We, we expect it first product live by June. Yeah. Yeah, Done. maybe we could bring him up on stage and find he could sell his wares like a market stall. Yeah, maybe, absolutely. My wife does say I'm the digital Dell boy, so maybe that works. The digital, you, you I like sound, that. As a, I like that. You as a sound brand. way too eloquent to be a digital <laughs> Dell boy. Um, listen, thanks for being on, Aaron. It's really lovely to have you here thanks on the show. Thanks for having me, chaps. Awesome stuff. No, well, I, I like going. him. Very smart operator. Yeah, yeah. Very good at what he does. He needs to be. He needs to have a podcast. If you don't get him having a podcast, you you failed. I failed. Yeah, because he, he could. Yeah, I want to be very happy once he's made 10 episodes to start saying, you should go and listen to this. See, mm. And I do believe that, you know, like even when people are confident, there is a skill to being good on a microphone, being on camera, being on stage. You do have to practice, don't you, a bit? To get yeah, because you've it. got to tell stories. You can't, what do they say? Facts, facts tell, stories sell. So you have to be able to craft yeah, yeah. the story as well as... Oh, we need to we need to rate him as an entrepreneur. Yeah, let's rate him as Quickly. an entrepreneur. Let's do the uh, okay. Okay, we're going to do the eight traits of great entrepreneurs, which is uh, we're now grading our guests um, for a, for a quiz and a test that they didn't ask for necessarily. No, but I don't like one. it that they're not here. Um, they are young, which I but no, he's, he can still he can still hear us in the background. Um, starting with the end in mind, well, I'm not sure he's got that. Oh no, he has. Yeah, he wants to build a ten million. Two no, million. he has. Yeah, yeah, we'll give him that. Yeah, so one, one. He's got one. He's got one. Passionate about their cause. I actually think he really he knows. Is. Yeah, he gets two. He gets two there. Number three. Uh, untold amounts of resilience. Uh, I don't know if he's been tested yet, but he's doing all right, isn't he, so far? So let's give him it's that. It's interesting, that. You, that's a good point, what you make there. Until you're tested, you don't know how resilient you are. No. This is quite safe. There's no real... Mind you, you wouldn't necessarily come on in an hour conversation and go, yeah, I've had like the worst ever year of my life. Thanks for asking, chaps. Yeah. Well, I don't know, so I'm not well, going to We'll say yes. He's right. part of your exec club. So he okay. might, he's going to need some resilience. Number four, he's definitely brilliant. got. They master relationships with people. Oh, I love to talk to him. I thought he was brilliant, yeah. yeah so he's got good. four. Four out of four so far, 100%. Number five, commercial awareness. I, I, no. It's a, it, no, it's a it's a, it's a it's a profitable job, you know. I'm afraid he, he needs to turn, you know, he needs to go over the big customers, the million pound plus spend, you know, really think. Which bigger. he can spend the time doing now and getting the understanding of now he's off the tools. So uh, that's number five. No, number six, they innovate so they don't evaporate. I reckon he will always innovate. Yeah, definitely. The digital marketing is, space. Yeah. yeah. Uh, number seven, they're master marketeers. Absolutely. Yeah, we give him that. Uh, they stay teachable and curious. Yeah, definitely. number eight. Uh, he's so got seven, seven out of eight. Way. Congratulations, <laughs> we Aaron. Super duper. I love doing that. Chat. This is yeah. one of my favourite things of the podcast. I'm glad that you like it. Do you, if like, you it? like it? In the comments on YouTube, let us know. Or if you're well, listening. I think it will be a slow burner within uh, of us doing this 50 times. Um, people will be like, oh, yeah, I'm looking forward to eight traits of greats. <laughs> Yeah, Sunday night, seven yeah. o'clock. Oh, yeah. Tracy Grace. Yeah, here we go. Uh, Brilliant what? stuff. Well, if you, like Aaron, would like to come and hear this podcast live in your earbuds, in your ear holes with a bunch of other entrepreneurs, 300 odd people will be piling into the Leicester Square Theatre. I'll bring it out to the universe, see what I've done there. Uh, we'll be coming to Leicester Square on June the 10th for James Sinclair's Business Broadcast Live. Like this very podcast, but bigger, better, and with people confetti <laughs> cannons and stuff um oh, just before we go we've got to go for a sound check have you seen that on the 15th yeah we've got to go for a tech night. check oh you're coming with us like, yeah, yeah of course we're going to make some Lady Gaga we're going to make some um, content I'm dressed as Gaga as well we're going to make some content there to promote it that's a good well. idea we that's, should do that well, that's, that's what we're going to do idea. that's why I'm going <laughs> um, I, I just one of the big, biggest learns uh, from the last couple of weeks and I, I think every now and then we should mention these things um, how many team members have you got in your little phonic media now uh, it's a, quite a big organisation grand total of six six how often do you have meetings with them weekly and what do you discuss in those meetings uh, launches that are coming up projects that we're working on um, any changes that are happening I'm trying to do a bit more like mission. so they're management and, meetings yeah but also like a little bit of like here's what's coming in the next couple of weeks mm. here's what we're thinking do you ever have the the meetings that I think are really effective it's like blue sky meetings like we've got a new idea that we should do probably don't do that enough so so if I'm honest I, I, I watched a little interview with Jeff Bezos have you heard of him yeah he's um, Be Bezos Branson Sinclair. That's the the, tri the trio of treats, isn't it? Jeff Bezos from uh, 
from uh, Amazon. <laughs> Did you forget where it's from? That well, I was going to say Blue Club. Origin. Oh, yeah. That's another that one of well. us. Imagine uh, that is your side hustle. Your side yes. hustle is putting a spaceship yeah. into orbit. Yeah. Well, we were speaking about uh, Investorpreneur, the seminar I did yesterday. It was talking about Steve Jobs. His side hustle was being the biggest shareholder in the Walt Disney Company. Yes. That's just, just quite the side hustle, Just running it? Apple. And then on the side, <laughs> I'm the biggest single shareholder in the Walt Disney Company. Dabbling. And before that, it was Pixar. Yeah, yeah. Crack on, Steve. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so... Um, so, I mean, it just those little conversations like that just make you realise um, how insignificant I feel. I mean, it is. There are some people that really do move mountains, and Steve Jobs and Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk. I just eye watering what they do, isn't it? I'm just mad. Anyway, I was. I, I saw a little thing come up. I think on an Instagram reel about how Jeff Bezos ran those meetings or any meetings. He would make people write a six-page document if they wanted to bring up an idea into a meeting. Oh, really? And for the beginning of the meeting, they have to read it word for word for half hour and then say, right, has anyone got any questions on this? Nope. Okay, right, let's crack on. And that, that's how he made his meetings really efficient. Wow. Okay. Because I think what we all do in those blue sky meetings is we all gather around and say, what do you think? What do you think? Yeah, yeah. And it becomes a very long-tailed thing. Yeah. Actually, if you commit it to paper and turn it into a document, six, but like written words, so people can read it. And he made them because they would never send it pre the meeting because he knows people would just skim it. Yeah, yeah. So now, right, we're all going to sit around the table here and we're going to read, read this okay. quietly yeah. for half an hour. Anyone got any questions? That's a very good, that's good that little good tactic. Idea, Have it? you ever heard that before? No. How hmm. often do you... You have we don't do that. Management meetings every week? Management meetings every single week. Uh, what did we do last week? What issues have we got? What opportunities are there? And what are we going to do next week? Like the called, lion concept. The lion concept, yeah. Um, but then blue sky meetings, so they're my favourite ones. You know, when you're like, oh, yeah, we could really do that. But I think they would be so much more effective if you bothered to write down like what Jeff... And that's probably why Jeff Bezos is Jeff Bezos. That is true. Do you think that maybe your team don't let you have blue sky thinking meetings because you're enough of a handful as no, because I, if I have an idea I'll just call the meeting and everyone's there <laughs> and then I'll present it um, and you know, the other thing that he did as well in all of his meetings is his senior leadership speak last because otherwise junior leadership oh, will not speak clever, up and it? say what the, their ideas because what usually tends to happen is junior leadership just agree with senior leadership yeah. that's why I always let you talk first on this podcast because I, I let you dictate as the as the senior the senior manager of the podcast, yeah, see, yeah. I mean, that's why we should do it the other way around. Then I can just pick you apart. <laughs> <laughs> there we what go. do you think? I Little learns, know. little learns from the business broadcast. There you go, fantastic. If you've enjoyed it, make sure you click the link in the show notes. Head to jamesinclair.net if you'd like to be there live to watch this podcast when we do it at Leicester Square. And, and also, if, if anyone's got any other little learns, any fascinating things like that, please drop me a message on Instagram at James Sinclair Entrepreneur. And if I think it's that fascinating, I'll mention. You and your business, and uh, we'll bring it out here on the business broadcast. Well, there you go. We will see you again on the next part. Oh, that little learns. That'll be another thing we'll we now bring in. God. Turn as we everybody. Live produce our podcast. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> see you later.